Okay, so welcome everybody to this last session of this fantastic uh, IPCO. Um, I will make a few remarks in the very end, but uh, now we have two more talks. And the first talk is by Rico Raba from Berlin. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm just gonna share my slides. Great. Okay, let's start. Uh, yeah, thanks for, for joining this talk. I'm going to give a, a short short overview over our recent pack, um, paper packing under convex quadratic constraints. And this is joint work with Max Klim and Mark Fetch and uh, Martin Scutella. So uh, yeah, what is packing under convex quadratic constraints all about? Uh, you probably all know the Natsik problem. So you have a set of items and each item has some profit and some weight. And you would like to maximize the total profit while making sure that the total weight is not too high. Yeah? This problem, you know. Um, and what is the total weight? Well, uh, in, the, in the classical knapsack problem, this would be just the sum of the weights of the individual items. So that would be a linear function. But in, uh, in our paper, we consider a, a more general case where we don't have a linear weight function, but a quadratic weight function. That means for any two items, A and B, that we take, we not only get the weight for item A and the weight for item B, but we also get an additional coupling weight for the two items together. And I start out by giving you a, a short motivation why we're interested in these kinds of problems and, and, and where they occur actually in, in practical application. And um, afterwards, I'll, I'll um, introduce the problem a bit more formally. And then the third part is the, the main part of the, the talk and also our main result in the golden ratio approximation algorithm for this kind of packing problem. And then I conclude the talk with some further results that we obtained in the paper. Okay, so let's talk about gas. So we are part of a, of a large uh, German transregional research project on the optimization of gas transport. And in this setting, we consider the following problem. Let's assume we're given um, some pipeline network, which could, for example, look like this and which is represented by a graph with nodes V and HSE. So now gas doesn't flow arbitrarily through that network, but it follows physical laws. And often these laws are modeled by the so-called Weymouth equations. So for each uh, node, we have some potential pi, which is the squared gas pressure at that node. And gas naturally flows from higher pressure to lower pressure. And more precisely, um, this model states that the difference of the uh, potential is proportional to the square of the flow through that edge. So this is the physical model. And on top of that, we're given a set of transportation requests between um, um, source sink pairs. So for, um, for each J, you have some source sink pair, so source SJ and a corresponding sink TJ. And for each such pair, you have some amount of gas, QJ, that you would like to transport from SJ to TJ. And um, you, we can decide if we accept this request or not. And if we do so, we get a profit of TJ. And then the natural optimization problem would be to uh, maximize the total profit while making sure that the pressure bounds are satisfied. And in general, so for general networks, uh, this problem would be, uh, would be really, really difficult. So um, we considered a special case where we have just uh, one single pipeline, uh, which corresponds to a, like a directed graph from left to right. So like in this example here, you have the sources S1 to S6 and the corresponding sinks T1 to T6. And at the beginning of the pipeline, you have the highest pressure. And in the end, you have the lowest pressure. And as I mentioned before, our goal will then be to choose a sub subset of transportations in order to maximize the total profit while making sure that the potential difference between the highest potential and like the highest pressure and the lowest pressure is not too high. Okay, so how do we model this constraint? Uh, this can actually be done in a quite straightforward way. Um, for each transportation request J, we introduce a binary variable XJ. And we set this to one if we fulfill this transportation request. So if actually SJ inputs gas and TJ outputs gas of the same amount. And then we can um, express this potential difference in the following way. So the 
the largest potential minus the lowest potential can just be written as a sum of the potential differences on the individual edges. And by Weymouth equations, we know that this potential difference is actually proportional to the flow, to the square of the flow through that edge. So this is the flow through that edge and, and the square. And the important thing to notice is here that we have now um, quadratic terms of these binary variables. And this expression can also be re re uh, rewritten in matrix notation. And then we get this problem here. So we maximize a linear profit function subject to this quadratic constraint here and x is a binary vector. And actually it, uh, it turns out that in this example, this matrix that we get here is positive semi-definite, which turns this quadratic constraint into a convex constraint. Okay, so this is the short motivation. And um, let's now introduce the, the problem a bit more formally. So it's basically exactly what you, what you just saw. So we have some non-negative profit vector and this symmetric, non-negative, positive semi-definite matrix W and some, uh, some capacity bound C. And we would like to maximize this linear function subject to this quadratic constraint and X being a binary vector. And as I said before, since uh, this matrix W is positive semi-definite, we actually have a convex, this, this red constraint here is a convex constraint. And geometrically, this means that um, this, this, uh, the feasible vectors must be contained in an ellipsoid. Okay. So, um, yeah, what is known about related problems? Um, first of all, if W, the weight matrix, is not required to be, uh, to be positive semi-definite, but can be just any arbitrary non-negative uh, matrix, uh, then we can actually encode the maximum independent set problem. And this is very difficult to approximate. Yeah? So Hofstadt showed that it's actually NP-hard to approximate within a factor than essentially better one over N. So this is the one extreme. And on the other hand, if the matrix um, W is, is diagonal, then we are getting back um, to the classical zero one knapsack problem. And for this, it is known that it admits a fully, to, a fully polynomial time approximation scheme. So our problem is a generalization of this. And then one result which comes um, quite close to our setting is um, by Albacioni and Nguyen. And they considered the case, also the, um, the convex quadratic, quadratic case, but on top of that, they require that this matrix W is completely positive. And this means it can be re uh, written as the product of a non-negative matrix um, U. Yeah, non-negative is important here. And um, this matrix U has small rank. So this K is bounded by a constant. And uh, under these requirements, they, um, they derived a polynomial time approximation scheme. Okay. So let's come uh, to the main part. Um, for our case of a non-negative and positive semi-definite weight matrix W, we could devise a golden ratio approximation algorithm for this kind of packing problems. And um, I'll give you the, the um, overview of the ideas of this algorithm. So let's first talk about relaxations. Yeah? Um, uh, widely used technique to construct approximation algorithms is uh, to consider a relaxation of the original problem. And for example, by relaxing this integrality constraint here, then we can solve this problem to optimality, but we get a fractional solution. And somehow we have to round this fractional solution back to a binary vector in order to get a feasible solution to the original problem. And the most naive way to do this here would be just to leave everything as is and only relax the integrality constraint. Yeah. But this actually doesn't work for our setting because one can show that this then leads to an unbounded integrality gap. So we cannot use this for a constant factor approximation algorithm. So we need to be a bit smarter than that. And um, yeah, what I show you now is um, two different kinds of relaxations which we obtain and when combined they're actually very useful for constructing an um, approximation algorithm. And for doing that, um, we will also relax the integrality constraint as before, but we also will um, add two different kinds of cuts, which will then turn this relaxation into two different kinds of relaxations we will then use to combine and, and construct our approximation algorithm. So for this, uh, let, let D be the diagonal of, uh, of this matrix W. So this is a vector and let capital D be the corresponding diagonal matrix. 
And now we exploit the fact that since every um, feasible solution to the original problem is binary, it makes no difference if we multiply this vector from both sides by this diagonal matrix D, or if we just multiply it by this vector D. That's the same. And therefore, we can also write um, this quadratic term here uh, in the following way. We first subtract the diagonal matrix um, capital D, and then we add this diagonal term again. Yeah? We just show that these are the same. And since this first term is non-negative, we can also lower bound this expression just by d times x. So now we have two expressions. We have one, this red equality here, and then we have the blue inequality here. And we will use these two expressions for two different kinds of relaxations of this problem. So let's first consider this, this, um, this blue inequality here. We know that every feasible solution to our original problem, as we saw before, uh, fulfills this quadratic constraint here. And now we also know that we have this blue inequality here. So we can just simply add this d times x at most c to our problem. Yeah, that would be a redundant inequality. So we can do that without changing anything. We can also round down the objective value because um, everything is integral in the, in the original problem anyway. But now we relax the, the integrality constraint. And this actually turns out to be now a convex relaxation with a bounded integrality gap. Yeah? And we will see this in a minute. And um, since this is now continuous and convex and quadratic, it's quite straightforward to, to see that this problem can actually be solved exactly in polynomial time. So this is our first uh, relaxation. Yeah, that's great. We can solve it efficiently. Um, but of course, it, it will return us some, some fractional solution. Yeah? And it's not clear yet how to transform this fractional solution to a binary vector. And this is actually where our second relaxation comes into play. So remember, we had these two expressions, the blue one and the red one. And now let's consider this, um, this, this red equality here. So the quadratic term can also be written in this way. So when we uh, take the original problem, then we can just substitute this left expression by the right expression. And then we get this kind of problem. And now again, we relax the integrality constraint. Yeah? And then something very interesting happens. I mean, first of all, this matrix here, uh, W minus D has only zeros on its diagonal. So it's, uh, it's certainly not um, um, sem positive semi-definite anymore, uh, unless the matrix W was diagonal to begin with. Um, so now we have a non-convex relaxation and it's not clear yet at all how to, uh, to solve this efficiently in general. Huh? So why would we be interested in this kind of problem if we cannot solve it efficiently? Well, because it has a very, um, very useful and interesting property, namely the following. Suppose somebody gives you some feasible solution to this problem. Yeah? It need not be an um, optimal solution, but just a feasible solution. And then we can always uh, transform this solution in linear time into another feasible solution, x bar, which has the nice property that it has at most one fractional value. And its profit is at least as good as the one of the first solution. So you see this lemma is actually the key to, um, to get back binary vector from a fractional one. Yeah? I mean, at least binary, but this last fractional term in the end, we'll just throw it away. And the proof idea of this lemma is actually rather simple. So this is our formulation. And let's assume we have some, um, some feasible solution X, which is fractional. And then take, you just take two fractional values, XI and XJ. And um, when you project this quadratic expression here onto these two dimensions, i and j, then the feasible region always looks like this. It's always this concave set here. So that means that the, um, the best, the, the highest profit will always be attained in one of these um, vertices here uh, at the side. That means that we can always increase one variable, let's say xi, and decrease the other one, xj, until, well, at, um, either x, x, um, i becomes one or xj becomes zero. And this without decreasing the objective value. Huh? So um, in this process, and we just repeat this process, you know, we, we take two fractional values, we increase one, we decrease the other one, and then um, we have one fractional value less. And in the end, we, we do that repeatedly. In the end, we're, we're left with only at most one fractional value. Okay, so now you've seen these two relaxation, one convex relaxation that we can solve efficiently, and another one which is non-convex, 
which we cannot solve efficiently. But the good thing is, once we have a feasible solution, we can basically turn it into a, um, a binary vector and therefore into a feasible solution of our original problem. And of course, well, it's quite obvious now what to do. Yeah, we combine these two relaxations. So first, we compute an optimal solution y to the convex relaxation. Okay. Since this is, uh, this is a relaxation, its, optima, uh, its objective value is at least as good as the optimal solution. And now comes the magical step, how to link these two relaxations. We scale down this vector here by a factor of phi, which is the inverse of the golden ratio. Yeah. And now the cool thing is that when we do this, we actually get a feasible solution to the non-convex relaxation. And this is exactly what we need. Yeah? Because now we know what to do. Once we have a feasible solution to the non-convex relaxation, we now, uh, by the lemma, we know that we can transform it into uh, another uh, feasible solution with at most one fractional value. And then the end, we just throw away this last uh, fractional value. And one last detail um, to make sure that this last um, step here of throwing away the fractional value um, we don't lose anything by that. We just combine this whole procedure with a partial enumeration scheme. And we, we partially enumerate over at most three elements in the beginning and then return the best solution of course. So that's the whole algorithm. So here you can see it, um, the entire algorithm again. This for each part is the uh, partial enumeration part. And then we do exactly what I said before. We compute an optimal solution to the convex relaxation we uh, scale it down by this, this vector of the inverse golden ratio and transform this vector into another vector with at most, at most one fractional value. And then in the end, we throw away this last fractional value. And we return the solution, the best solution that we find in this process. And since the uh, only point where we actually lose any profit is by the scaling here, it's actually quite easy to say to see that this algorithm indeed computes a phi approximation where phi is the, the inverse golden ratio. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is already the, the, the whole algorithm, the, the main part that I wanted to show you. And to conclude with, I just give you a quick overview um, of uh, some further results that we showed. Um, first of all, um, we showed that this problem of packing under convex quadratic constraints is, um, is actually um, APX hard. That means there exists no polynomial time approximation scheme for this kind of problem. And we did this by a, a reduction from the six set packing problem. And then we also showed that um, the greedy algorithm actually when, when, um, when combined with partial enumeration also yields a constant factor approximation um, this constant factor or uh, this approximation ratio is somewhere between one minus square root of three over E and again here this phi. Um, so we found an, um, an instance um, for this upper bound here. And this is somehow really interesting because I mean, we have the, the golden ratio algorithm and the greedy algorithm, which work completely differently. Yeah? Uh, but still somehow for this upper bound, again, we have this number of the, of the inverse golden ratio. So there, there must be some, some deeper truth behind that. Huh? Um, don't know yet exactly what it is, what it always creates this, this value, but, um, but it's actually a really interesting property. And then another interesting fact for, especially for people who are interested in mechanism design, these two algorithms that I just told about, the golden ratio algorithm and the greedy algorithm, we can also combine them and in that way obtain a monotone algorithm and in this way obtain a strategy proof mechanism. Okay, and the last part is um, we also consider the um, more general case where we have not only one quadratic constraint, a convex quadratic constraint, but um, a constant number of these quadratic constraints, yeah? also with different matrices and different right sides. And here we are still working on uh, generalizing these two algorithms of the golden ratio, the golden ratio algorithm and the greedy algorithm. Um, but what we could prove so far is that uh, we showed that a different algorithm based on randomized rounding actually yields a constant factor approximation for this kind of problem, given that we have a constant number of these uh, convex quadratic constraints. 
Okay, that's already it. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to ask for questions. We have plenty of time for questions. Uh, maybe I start with a question. So can you explain a little bit more uh, about this magic that you explained when you scale <laughs> down uh, by this factor? Why is it then feasible? Yeah, um, sure. Um, so let's have a look at, at the equality, uh, the, the constraints here. So you, um, well, first this one. We, we said that we um, compute an optimal solution to the convex relaxation. Yeah? So now we have a solution which uh, fulfills these constraints here. And now we have to show that um, when scaling down this vector, we actually get a feasible solution to the non-convex relaxation. So keep in mind these two constraints here, this quadratic one and then the linear one. And now let's have a look at the constraint of the non-convex one. We have here the sum of this quadratic one and this linear one. So if we now um, plug in this, this, uh, this number phi, or just like any, just like take any number that we scale down, yeah? Then we get this number here, our scaling factor here squared, and we get it here simple. Yeah? And um, since we know that this term here is um, for, for our optimum solution of the, um, of the convex relaxation, this is upper bounded by C. Yeah? Because you know that this, this expression is, uh, is upper bounded by just X times the matrix W times X, so without the D, yeah? And this is, this is smaller than this. So this expression here is upper bounded by C. And this expression here is also upper bounded by C. And now you just scale, yeah? So, so you get the scaling number here squared and you get it here just uh, linearly, yeah? So you, you just have to make sure that phi squared plus phi equals one. And this is exactly the inverse golden ratio. Okay, thanks. So that's, that's the big, biggest number that we can choose in order to always yes, yes, it. Sure. Uh, Joe Part had a question in the chat, but probably it's maybe all, all already answered now. Yeah. Okay. Apparently, it's uh, you have answered this already. So, anybody else has a question? You can raise your hand, or you can uh, enter your question in the chat as you prefer. But maybe the easiest is to raise the hand in the participants list. Okay, if not, then let me unmute everybody to give an applause. There, there is a, a question. There's, the there's a question? Okay. How is different to having more <laughs> or less? <laughs> yeah, I just want to. Okay, let me. Yes. yes. So, sorry. Um, so, let me unmute. Okay. It doesn't seem to work. Can anybody help me unmute? Uh, no, you cannot unmute. So one has to unmute oneself. Okay. Uh, so there's a question in the chat. Uh, uh, the question is, can you explain more on why the constraint X transpose W minus T X plus T transpose X less or equal to C is concave? Yeah, that red. Uh, you're muted, Rico. Rico, you yeah, yeah. yeah, I think you should hear me now. Um, well, this basically comes from the fact that you cancel all the quadratic terms. I mean, the, the one x, xi squared and xj squared and so on. So this is because you have this on the diagonal, you only have zeros. So you basically, you always only have terms of the form xi times xj and so on. And um, when you consider this function x, xi times xj, then it, it, it just looks like this. Yeah? And this you have for all, when, no matter which two dimensions you take. Yeah? 
you always have that because you always for all um, all diagonal um, entries are, are zero and then it looks like this and this is why we can do this process of of swapping of increasing one and decreasing the other one and then uh, ending up in one of these vertices which yield um, an equal or even better profit okay thanks any further questions If not, then I unmute everybody to for an uh, applause to Rico. Thank you.